So jumping right in, one of the key points to understand about stress and trauma is that they are fundamentally non-cognitive phenomenon. Now, this is somewhat of a controversial statement because most models in psychotherapy are cognitive in nature. Talk therapy is designed to help people uncover their hidden belief systems, to gain insights and iron out distorted thoughts that can lead to suffering. But what we're learning from the field of neuroscience is that stressful and traumatic experiences in particular and their symptoms are primarily housed in the more primitive, the non-conscious, the non-cognitive, and especially the non-verbal area of the mind, namely in the autonomic nervous system. So what is the autonomic nervous system? First, it's not unique uh, to being human. Every mammal on this page shares the same basic autonomic setup. We're talking about a part of the mammalian nervous system that evolved long before the distinctly human part evolved. We can observe the same stress reactions in humans that we can in other mammals that don't even have the higher capacity for consciousness or cognitive thought. A mouse does not need to have distorted thoughts or distorted belief systems or stinking thinking, as they say in the 12-step programs, to have stress or trauma symptoms. So this is all to say that stress and trauma are basic biological phenomenon. They're, it's, they're housed in the mammalian nervous system. Uh, in the biopsychosocial model of mental health, this is the biological component. Here's another way to think about the autonomic nervous system. So right now you're sitting there, you're listening to what I'm saying, your conscious mind is trying to understand this information, and at the same time, your heart rate is being regulated. Your body temperature is being controlled. Your pupils are dilating and adjusting relative to the amount of light in your room. Your breathing and the level of oxygen in your blood is being regulated. Your digestion and the, um, your hormonal balance is being controlled for you. Literally, there are thousands and thousands of physiological functions that are essential to your survival that you're not aware of, or in control of that are being managed for you by your autonomic nervous system. And all of this is happening below the level of consciousness, which is to say that you don't have to think about your heart beating for it to beat. It just does it. So as the name signifies, these are all automatic processes that are always going on inside of you. The takeaway here is that this non-conscious, invisible part that most people never think about or identify with as who they are is actually responsible for a massive amount of your experience. The ANS deeply influences your sensations, whether you feel calm and relaxed or you're amped up or depressed, your emotional state, your moods. Uh, it also affects how you relate to yourself how you see and feel about other people, especially uh, those close relationships like family members, romantic partners, children, whether you can trust others or if people are inherently dangerous. It sort of influences that question. Um, it determines a lot about how you feel about the world, whether it's a good place, a safe place, or is it a dark place. For the most part, most of us think that we are our thoughts. Uh, the science is suggesting otherwise. The science is saying that much, much more of who you are and how you operate in the world is run by your autonomic programming. The ANS is particularly relevant in uh, conversation about stress and trauma because this is where the reactivity is located. This is where the discomfort, the depression, high anxiety states that make you want to crawl out of your skin, those types of reactions and symptom sets are all housed here. Now, given that introduction to the autonomic nervous system, an important second point about how stress and trauma function is that they are, or they were at one point anyway, adaptive survival responses to a threat. In other words, these symptoms are not random behaviors or, or random feelings. They are not nonsensical. They do make sense, or they at least made sense, in a particular context. That context is one of threat. What we see here is a relationship between the level of threat a person or an animal experiences and the level of reactivity or reaction in the autonomic nervous system. The greater the threat, the greater the reaction. 
Here's what this relationship between threat and activation looks like on a map. I'll pick an example that I think we can all relate to. So let's say that you're driving along on the highway on a wintry night. It's snowing outside. You're listening to the radio. You're relaxed. Everything's okay. But let's say that the threat level goes up somehow. Uh, let's say you hit a patch of ice on the road. And we've all had this experience, right, where for a split second, you don't have control of the car. In that second, your autonomic nervous system reacts. You grip the steering wheel hard, you become hyper-focused on the road, you feel your heart thumping in your chest, and adrenaline just got pumped into your, uh, your system, and this all happens in a fraction of a second. This is a beautiful, adaptive response where the nervous system amps up to help you deal with the threat of losing control of your car. Now, let's say that it was only a small patch of ice. Let's say you recover control and realize that if you drive home more slowly, you'll be fine. And let's say you do make it home and you're safe and sound in bed. Now, in this case, the threat level has gone back down to zero, right? You're, you made it home. And what gradually happens is that the nervous system begins to calm down as well. Uh, your muscles relax, your shoulders unwind, the adrenaline leaves your system. Your whole, your whole system begins to calm down because you're out of danger. One way to think about this is, uh, one way to think about the nervous system is like a marble on a track. It seeks the most stable, relaxed position it can roll into. And this is because it takes biological energy to maintain activation. And there's no need to maintain that level of energy expenditure if there's no danger. However, we're finding through research uh, that the autonomic nervous system is much more sophisticated than that example I just gave. There are situations where even when the, the threat is passed, the ANS can retain activation. This is due to attractor states, or troughs, built into the nervous system, and it looks something like this on the map. Now I'm going to change the example here and borrow an animal example from National Geographic. And remember, the autonomic nervous system is common to us as well as other mammals, so this map applies to a zebra being hunted, or a car accident, or a soldier at war, or a child growing up in an alcoholic family. With minor variations, it's all pretty much the same anomic level. So let's say that you and I are part of a zebra herd, and we're on the African plains, it's a lovely day, we're grazing on grass, and so our nervous system is at state zero, uh, relaxed and awake. Then we hear some rustling in the bushes, and we don't know what it is. It could be the wind, or it could be a lion. So again, in this case, the perceived danger just went up and everybody's nervous system moves into an activated state. But let's say it was just the wind. The marble will roll back down into that state zero place, just like it did in the previous driving example. Now, let's say a, wild, a little while passes and we do spot a lion way off in the distance, hundreds and hundreds of feet off. She's stalking the herd. In here, there is a very real threat. It's not immediate, but we have to remain hypervigilant and keep an eye on the lion. So the nervous system moves into the state one trough. This is mild stress. Uh, it's a stable state, meaning that we can remain in it for a very long time. Here are some of the symptoms of state one. I won't read the entire list, so feel free to pause the video. And uh, But the highlights here are fear, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, you can't easily relax enough to sleep uh, if your system is on edge. Uh, body tensions are quite common here, like um, you know, a contraction, tightness, uh, tight jaw, headaches. Uh, there's often a need to fidget or move as part of the state. And generally, there's a, there's a sense of dis-ease in one's body. So going back to the map, there are a few relevant points to notice about state one. It is a stable state, and we can exist in it in mild stress for years or even a lifetime, but it is significantly more activated state zero. A metaphor I use when teaching is that state zero is like living in Hawaii. It's calm, it's peaceful, and state one is like living in Manhattan. 
you have to be a bit more amped up to navigate the crowds of a big city or to navigate the subway system. Now, there is a really good reason and a, a good adaptive survival-based reason why these troughs exist in the, in the nervous system in the first place. When something happens, when the lion is done stalking and decides to go after one of, the, one of the zebras, it's much easier, it's faster and more effective to react to a life or death threat from state one, from the uh, activation that's inherent in state one, than it would be if we were caught off guard at state zero. Calmness is a great state to be in, but it won't serve you if you're about to be attacked. So these troughs are adaptive and they're the source of the problem. Remember, it takes biological energy to be on guard, to be hypervigilant, to be at state one, and the nervous system naturally wants to move back down to state zero when the danger is passed. But to do this, the marble has to go over this bump that's to the left of state one, which means a rise in anxiety symptoms. And this is the key point, that there's going to be a rise in anxiety, in feeling more panicky, in tension, a rise in all of the state one symptoms that we talked about before, before there's a much deeper calming that takes place. Things feel worse before they feel better. And keep this pattern in mind because it's the key to how and why stress and trauma patterns can get locked inside of us for years. Now I'm going to talk about what resolution looks like for most mammals versus what it looks like for us. So for most mammals, when the, when the threat is passed, they begin to process the nervous system state. Right? They begin, the, the marble begins to move. And you'll notice that the first point here is about safety. Uh, animals will seek out a calm, safe resting place like a den uh, to begin this process. And uh, this is true for all of us. Uh, the achievement of safety is an essential, it's a fundamental initial condition that has to be met before resolution begins to take place. Uh, the second point here, um, the, the mammal will go back to the somatic state that their body was in when the threat occurred, which is to say that if they responded with a state one uh, reaction, with a state one response, then when they're processing it, their body will return to the same state one set of responses. Uh, and as we saw in the last slide, uh, the marble moves over the peak, the symptoms increase in severity, and then finally pass. And then finally, almost all wild mammals do not stay traumatized. There are some exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, that's true. Now, in terms of how it works for humans, when a threat passes, we move into an activated state, but we typically interrupt the process, and here's why. One of the main reasons we interrupt the process is because we misunderstand what's happening. So imagine that you're sitting at home, it's a quiet evening, everything's okay, and you notice a little anxiety building or a little worry about something, and you ignore it at first, and but it continues to grow. Let's say your gut gets a little tight. So you might say to yourself, why am I feeling this way? There's nothing wrong, there's nothing going on. And eventually, you will you might distract yourself by turning on the TV or going for a walk or getting something to eat. And that feeling will go away. And this is the paradox of it all, that it's precisely because nothing is wrong that your system's allowing you to feel these, these symptoms. It's precisely because nothing is wrong that the marble is beginning to move. Now, um, the other big reasons that we find that uh, we stop the process is that, well, uh, it feels worse before it gets better. Um, you know, it's, it, it's uncomfortable to feel uh, panicky sensations. And finally, we stop the process because we can. We've got these big frontal lobes, these uh, big neocortexes that we're walking around with that we can use to stop the process if we want to. Uh, other mammals, such as elephants, that also have um, uh, big frontal lobes also have the capacity to remain traumatized. So moving on to how we stop the process. All of the coping mechanisms we have to interrupt it have to do with distraction in one form or another. And one of the big ways we do this is by physical movement. Um, I'll pretty much guarantee you that if you're feeling anxious or activated, 
and you go for a 10 mile run, you're not going to be feeling anxious afterwards. There's just not enough biological energy left to, uh, to knock the marble off track. Movement based distractions can be more subtle as well, right? Like uh, taking three deep breaths to calm down. Uh, it's a really good skill to have, but it can interrupt the movement of the marble. Uh, fidgeting is a big one here. Uh, if you're one of those people uh, who have to wiggle a lot or move, um, all the time. Uh, see what happens to you if you try an experiment here. If you sit still for 30 seconds or so and focus on your experience. If you start to become more activated, if your muscles begin to contract or you get more nervous, this is your nervous system talking to you. Okay. So uh, the next category is mental distractions. Uh, if you don't allow some quiet focus on yourself, if you don't allow some introspection time and noticing what your experience is like, uh, and if you, by turning on the TV or getting externally focused with work or other people, it'll serve to calm you down. And this is, this is all to say that if you go to the beach in your head a lot, the marble is not going to move. And then finally, there is the realm of addiction, both behavioral addiction, like sex and gambling, or substances like alcoholism and uh, opiate addictions. These are the firefighters of the nervous system. They're sort of the heavy duty uh, squelchers of, of autonomic movement. And typically, uh, this means that a person has enough stress and trauma that's active in their nervous system that taking a walk or watching a movie won't distract them enough. Uh, in fact, I, I've never worked with a client with addiction that doesn't also have a significant trauma history. So there, there's no value judgment here. These activities can be distractions that we, have, uh, that we have to use to manage our nervous system, and they can be resources that make us feel grounded and good. There's no good or bad to it. Um, and I actually encourage clients to develop a healthy list of distractions that they can rely on so they can choose when to go into autonomic responses and, when they can, and, and choose when to not go into them. Uh, if they have to be functional for work or for kids and family. Right? So <clears throat> to summarize, we are discharging autonomically all the time. This feels good in the short run, but keeps the stress and traumas in place for years. So if we do the reverse of discharge, if we inhibit or if we contain the discharge mechanism, people begin to notice their marble begins to move. Uh, if we if we inhibit voluntary movement, right, discharge movement, and bring awareness to the body, it makes room for more subtle, more nuanced, involuntary, autonomic sensations and autonomic reactions to emerge. Um, and these don't feel good necessarily, but they're an important part of healing. So we took a little detour here after describing state one, but the hard part of the theory is over. And the dynamics we just talked about applies not only to the movement from state one to zero, but also to the three other troughs on the map, which we're about to complete right now. So if we go back to the National Geographic example on the map, the lion was a few hundred feet away from the zebra herd, stalking them, and everybody's nervous system was at state one. And let's say that after stalking the herd for a while, the lion does pick one zebra to go after, and she launches into a full-out chase. The threat level increases significantly here. The lion is no longer an idle threat. She's an active life-or-death danger to the zebras. And at this point, everyone in the system, the zebras as well as the lion, move into high stress, or state two, which is defined as maximum activation, maximum performance. If you're a zebra, you either run or you die. The autonomic nervous system is in full fight or flight mode at this point. And the intensity that happens at state two is short lived. If you've seen this on TV, you know that the chase only lasts for about 30 seconds or so. The line either gets her prey or she doesn't, but either way, the chase is over. The nervous system simply can't put out that much energy for a sustained of time like it can with mild stress. So instead of a trough, instead of a stable state, state two is drawn, drawn as a flat line. This means that it's a semi-stable place and the marble can easily roll to a different state from here. And here are the state two high stress symptoms. 
This is where panic attacks come from. Hyperventilation happens here, racing heart, sweating, trembling. Basically, if you take all the symptoms in state one and amp them up to the max, you get state two. So instead of anger, you get rage. Instead of fear, you get terror. And remember that this is your body giving all that it's got to deal with a threat. Panic, rage, hyperventilation, as scary and painful as these symptoms are, they make sense in this threatening context. And they were valuable responses that served you at some point, even if they're not serving you today. And also remember that this state doesn't last. Clients who enter state two have these symptoms for 30 seconds or so, and, and the marble continues on to a calmer state after that. Now we're coming to a critical point in the stress and trauma process. Everything we've covered so far is stress or high stress. It's not trauma. Even though it can be terrifying and involve panic, we're still in the realm of fighting and fleeing. All the defensive responses are still active. The psyche hasn't fragmented. There's no dissociation as part of the defensive response yet. In other words, we are still in the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Trauma shows up at a very specific moment. When the threat increases to the point where fighting or fleeing isn't enough, we hit an overwhelm point. We have a sense that we're not going to make it. At this point, a massive parasympathetic response emerges and your body begins to shut down. You go into a collapsed, numb state that looks like giving up. Animals in this state can have a stunned quality. It's, it's what happens to a mouse when a cat has gotten a hold of it and is batting it around. Uh, you might know of this state as playing dead. Um, and here's what it looks like on the map. So if you're that zebra being chased by the lion, you're at the height of your sympathetic arousal up, to, up at state two, your heart is racing, your breath is fast and shallow, your muscles are firing, you're sprinting, darting left and right, doing everything you can to get away from the lion. If it works, the marble will just roll down to state one. But if it doesn't work and the lion is closing in on you, you're giving it your all and it's not working, at some point your system's going to hit overwhelm. And, and, and the nervous system says, essentially, I'm not going to make it, and goes into a state three moderate trauma response. And think of state three as negative activation. Because your nervous system believes that you're probably not going to make it, it floods your brain with opiate-type chemicals that have the effect that morphine has on pain. The system is being flooded with numbing dissociative chemicals. It's sort of a final gift of nature. If you're going to die, or be severely injured, you might as well not feel it. And this is the parasympathetic nervous system doing its magic. Now, if you remember from the first part of the presentation, the parasympathetic system handles calming, sleep, and relaxation. But this is not that. State three, moderate trauma, is more of a forced dissociation. And here are the symptoms of state three, moderate trauma. Sleepiness, heaviness, Clients will often feel as if they have heavy arms or, and legs or a heavy head. Um, muscles lose their tension and feel weak here. And there's often fogginess or confusion in terms of a person's thought process, but also in terms of their vision. Uh, where state one and two will have sensations of heat, state three will feel cold. And this is your body shifting blood flow patterns. And you'll notice this as a change in temperature. Uh, nausea is common here, as well as hopelessness and depression. In fact, I've never worked with a trauma client who didn't have a significant hopelessness or a sense that their condition was going to go on forever. And this makes all the sense in the world. If the situation did look hopeful, you probably wouldn't have hit that overwhelm point to begin with. Now, there's an important caveat to state three, which is that it is dual activated. This means that all the anxiety, tension, fear, and heat of states one and two are still there, but state three is like a big heavy wool blanket being placed over these hot symptoms. Dual activated means that you get both hot and cold symptoms, anxiety and depression, either at the same time or alternating in cycles. Now, I won't go into this uh, in this segment, but when most clinicians, uh, most psychiatrists and medical professionals 
hear anything about cycling between anxiety and depression, between arousal and lethargy, the standard diagnosis is bipolar disorder. This can be this can be the case. This can definitely be what's going on. But more often than not, what the research is telling us is that trauma and the cycling that's inherent in it is far more common. Again, I'll, I'll save most of this discussion for the clinical in implications section. But uh, for now, just know that mixed hot and cold symptoms often indicate state three moderate trauma. Now, the dual activated nature of state three has an adaptive survival value to it. If the lion gets distracted or the cat batting the mouse around gets bored, the anxiety and hot symptoms of state one and, and two are still available to turn on and get the zebra or the mouse to safety. So fight or flight are still available in the off chance that there's a possible way out. But if that doesn't happen, let's say the lion doesn't get distracted or bored, but instead picks up the zebra and takes it into her den where there are six other lions waiting. At this point, there's no solution. There's no possible escape, and the nervous system moves to the final stage or the state on the map, state four, or severe trauma. Basically, all the fight and flight symptoms that could have been useful at another point are turned off because they're not going to be helpful anyway with six lines surrounding the zebra. There's no way out. State four is a much deeper form of dissociation where people don't feel much of anything. They are absolutely calm. It's not anxious. It's not depressed. It's a feeling of nothingness, of numbness. Many clients describe it like they're inside of a black hole or floating in space without weight. They can't feel much of their body and, then, and they don't have emotions. This is where out-of-body experiences take place. It almost feels like a pure witness consciousness, like the calm eye at the center of a hurricane. Uh, thinking can be fairly clear here as well. And interestingly enough, people welcome this place because it's a, it's a respite it, from all the reactivity on the map. They often feel like it is their final escape where they can't be touched or hurt no matter what happens on the outside. So even though it may sound severe, it is fairly common. Most people don't live in state four, but they can go there for a visit under certain conditions. Uh, people who are abused as children often have some state four inside of them. If you've ever been in a relationship with someone who gets cold or gets distant and loses all empathy during a fight, that's a little of what state four can look like. Here's a list of some state four severe trauma symptoms. One important point about state four is that the parasympathetic numbness uh, is so thorough here that you won't cycle between the state four symptoms that are listed on this page and anxiety symptoms like you would in state three. Uh, the other point is that from the outside, from a behavioral perspective, state four can look exactly like state zero, calm and awake. But it couldn't be more different on the inside. Um, state zero is connected. It has feeling. It is fundamentally associated. State four is exactly the opposite. It's profoundly disassociated. So that's it. This is the basic map of the autonomic nervous system. Now, I haven't talked about what healing looks like on this map, and I won't go into too much depth on that right now, but the basics of it involves setting up the conditions that allow the marble to move left on the map. So it's just like when you're getting too hot and overheating. Your body begins to automatically sweat to cool yourself down. So it is that when we become stressed or traumatized, the body has a natural mechanism for releasing that charge and bringing us down to state zero. This is a very organic process, and we tend to interrupt it uh, because it can be uncomfortable or scary, and we typically don't understand it when it's happening to us. So if you're starting from state four, it means going to state three, which is a movement out of blankness to feeling depressed and hopeless. So it, it's, a, it's a little counterintuitive here, but moving from blankness to depression is actually a positive movement here. Now, going from state three to two involves moving from hopeless, sleepy, depressed to a, a high anxiety state. This can be uncomfortable and scary because it involves feelings of fear or panic, 
But remember, if it was if it was easy, it wouldn't be called trauma. Basically, what's happening here is that the further left you move on the map, the more you leave dissociative states, and the more you enter into association with your experience. Now, moving from state two to one is a movement from high anxiety to low anxiety, and it's, it's fairly easy to achieve. Uh, remember, state two is a semi-stable state. And finally, there is the movement from state one to zero. Now, some final thoughts on the topic before we end. Uh, there's a couple of pieces of good news here. The first is that resolution is very possible. And second, secondly, that it's relatively easy to work with anxiety symptoms. I'm talking about state one stress or state two high stress here. The psyche hasn't fragmented yet or moved into depression. The fight or, fly, the fight or flight impulse is still active. So when someone walks into my office and they predominantly have anxiety symptoms or hot symptoms, that's actually a pretty good sign. It's good news in terms of relieving symptoms and for how long someone can expect to be in therapy. We're talking anywhere from a few sessions to a few months of work. And even though anxiety feels bad, it has a very hopeful prognosis. Most of the students that we train to work with uh, stress and trauma become quite good at working through anxiety states. Now, in my opinion, the true art of trauma therapy uh, and what makes it complex shows up when working with dissociation. I would go so far as to say that if you're not working with dissociation directly, you're not contacting the trauma. You're working with high st stress or high stress states. For people who have experienced trauma in their lives, the most tender, the most feeling, the most alive aspects of who they are can often get hidden underneath dissociation. It's like a child running into a closet for safety. They're not coming out of that closet until the world is a safe place. Now, in terms of working with it, with state three, but especially with state four, you have to work with what is missing, uh, with emptiness, not just with what's there, but with what's not there. So you have to support the client becoming associated to their dissociation to get the marble to start moving again. So reiterating the point from above, it's very possible to resolve past stress and trauma that have been locked in the nervous system for years. And so this is, this is all to say that Having stress or trauma is not a life sentence uh, of being on medications to mitigate anxiety or depressive symptoms. It's quite workable. So that's it. What you've seen is a super condensed excerpt from one of the maps that we use in our trainings and workshops. If you're a mental or medical health professional, or in particular, if you work in the addictions field, you'll find a lot more information and videos at the Love and Trauma website, which is loveandtrauma.com. If you're interested in trainings or hosting a workshop at your agency, please do contact us at info at loveandtrauma.com. And finally, if you're a member of the general public and you're interested in finding a therapist that works in this modality, or if you have questions, feel free to contact us as well. We'll be happy to refer you to a car trained therapist or at least point you in the right direction. So thank you for your time, your attention, and take care.